um, unless you will produce a million spores over the course of its short life above Earth, above the ground. Um, the, at the top right, we have, these are my highly my magnified microscopic slides. Um, that is called the basidia. And this is one of the main ways that the class of mushrooms we call basidia mycetes. This is how they reproduce. That kind of long stalk-like thing, or the long bulby thing, is called the basidia. At the end of that, there's three little prongs, and on each of those prongs is a single spore. That's what you're looking at there. So mushrooms that reproduce in this way are basidia mycetes. At the bottom is a different type of mushroom reproduction, which is used by morels and cup fungi and a bunch of things you wouldn't know what they were. And in this case, the spores are inside of the sort of a sac. So we call them sac fungi. fungi. See, now I'm doing it myself. I'm saying it different every time I say it. Um, so either way, these are what carry the spores. These are these structures, the basidia or the, uh, the, the ASCII, actually it's pronounced ASCII, as a matter of fact, but I don't say it that way. Um, they're on the underside of the mushroom, in the case of a cap and stem mushroom, they're underneath, hanging down, ready to do their job when the time comes. So that's what they do. Now this is an example of typical cap and stem mushroom growth. Cap and stem mushrooms are probably the mushrooms that most people are familiar with. It's the kind you see, it's the kind you buy in the grocery store most of the time. There's lots of other kinds, but these are the most familiar. These are the basidium mycetes. And this is the green sword lepidota, which is a toxic mushroom, chlorophyllum molybdides. There you go. This is a toxic mushroom that's very, very common in the Minneapolis neighborhood where I spend my, when I'm not up here, I'm in Minneapolis. And these grow up in beautifully manu manicured lawns. People get really upset about it, very excited. <laughs> How can I get rid of that mushroom? And you know what? You can't. It's there for a reason. It's growing on something that's in the ground. There's nothing you can do about it. Because they are toxic, they're not deadly. But there's more mushroom poisoning to life every year by this mushroom than any other mushroom that there is. Because it grows in people's lawns, it looks edible, it looks tasty, you know, it's like, oh, I can still pick that and fry it up. And you probably won't kill you. I don't know if there's any deaths attributed to this. Make you pretty sick. And I always worry when I see them if someone who's maybe immunocompromised or wouldn't maybe do so well with it, or even a pet would eat one. And if I see one growing in the neighbor's arm in Minneapolis, I'll go and knock on their door and say, you know, would you mind if I pick that and I'll get rid of it for you? So I'm kind of the neighborhood mushroom control. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> okay, so this mushroom is the exact same mushroom in all three shots. It's the same, not just the same species, it's the same mushroom. I went back to it every day and took pictures of it. So this is how cap and stem mushrooms work. They start out like this, they're closed. And the spores are developing inside of that closed cap. And this particular mushroom, a lot of mushrooms like this, have what's called a veil underneath the cap when it opens up. And that veil, when the mushroom starts to open up as it's starting to do it, the top right photo is the same mushroom one day later. So it's gone from this to like this. And it's got that veil underneath, and two days after that, it's gone to that thing at the bottom right. It's like this now, it's completely open. The veil underneath has broken, and this little, this little business here, it's a remnant on the stem of the veil. It's called a grain or an annulus. And a lot of mushrooms have that. And these are some of the things that we look at to identify mushrooms. Does it have a ring? Does it, you know, uh, what shape is the cap when it's mature? What, what does the stem look like? There's a lot of things you have to look at. But if you see a mushroom with an annulus ring, that's your, you've got a pretty good uh, ID characteristic. Another thing that's interesting, and I'll just say this, some people probably know this, most people probably don't, that the button mushroom that you buy in the store, the white button mushroom, is the same mushroom that you buy in the store called cremini or brown mushroom just a little bit older, 
It's also the exact same mushroom as what you buy in the store called Portobello's. It's the same mushroom kind of at that lower right stage. It's opened up. And if you buy Portobello's in the store, you'll often see brown powder on the little tray, and that's the spores. It's, the mushroom has fulfilled its job, it's released, it's, it's been picked, it knows the game's up, it's got to get rid of its spores, it's going to die. And so it's going to release its mushrooms, so when the harvesters put it on that tray, it goes back and releases all of its spores. And so you can see the brown spores on the, the tray from the grocery store. So mushrooms, disperse their spores. These kinds of mushrooms have a similar mechanism, but there's three types of mushrooms that, there's three ways that cap and stem mushrooms can be. These are two of them. And it's, it's kind of surprising how few people know this. Um, we had, this is nothing against these guys, but we had uh, Macmillan Tree Service out last year to take down some trees. A lot of people up here know the one. Great, great people, great guys. Very knowledgeable about many things about the outdoors. Mushrooms is not one of them. And when they were all done, we were standing around dogs and, and they saw a mushroom on the roadside and they said, oh, look at that a mushroom, do you know what that is? I said, yeah, well, let's take a look. And I picked it up and I flipped it upside down. And they're like, what are you doing? They said, well, this mushroom has pores. And they came over and they said, what do you mean it has pores? What is that? And I said, well, it doesn't have gills, see? Like, that mushroom has gills. They'd never once picked up, none of them had ever picked up a mushroom in the wild and looked at it. They didn't even know that such a thing was possible. It's like, it's a mushroom. So, gills are a pretty common thing for a lot of mushrooms that we buy in the store, and they're plate-like structures that emanate out from the cap. They're very thin. And the spores, those, the, those uh, sac from the sac, those sacs or the whatever it is that I showed you, the city of Mercedes, slide, they grow between the gills, and when the mushroom opens up, it ejects the spores, it actively ejects them from the, uh, from basically it shoots them out from the cap. And some mushrooms will produce a little bit of water vapor at the same time, which helps the spores, it doesn't, they don't just fall on the ground, they kind of rise into the air with the, with the water vapor. So that's kind of a way of increasing their ability to spread their spores, which is what they're all about. So, in addition to gills, we have mushrooms with pores. There's a lot of mushrooms with pores up here, really a lot of them. And some of the most popular culinary mushrooms, the bolates, porcini, for example, are have pores, not, not gills. The mushroom at the top right, that's a chrome-footed bolete, and I took that picture at Birch Lake, where our cabin is, and the pores are so fine on that, the bottom of that mushroom that it looks like a marshmallow almost. You can't really perceive individual pores. Really, really fine mushroom. And what the pores are, think of a bundle of really, really super tiny drinking straws, really fine drinking straws hanging from the inside of the bottom of the cap. And that's what the pores are. They're a bunch of little tiny tubes. And the spores are going to drop down through those tubes. So if you cut a like that, that chrome foot of foliate, if you cut the cap in half from top to bottom, you would see the layer of the cap flesh, which is called the context, and then underneath it you would see little tubes, which is kind of cool. And that thing on the bottom right is also a cord mushroom, but these pores are really big and they're angular, so pores come in all different sizes. They can be really super fine, they can be really big like that one on the bottom right. Oh, let's see, did I miss anything here? No, I don't think I did. Okay, so you've got your mushrooms and you've got to get rid of those spores. What does that look like? This mushroom on the left, which is um, Anapis lucaria, also called the deceiver, has shot some of its spores and it's been intercepted by a leaf. Its spores are white. The color of the spores is another ID feature that we look at. Um, we always study every aspect of the mushroom, but the spore color is one of the big ones. We make a spore print, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. Now, in this case, the spores would be white. You can see that. It's interesting that the gills are black. Often, with a black gilled mushroom, the spores are black, but in this case, it's white. The picture on the right, 
is, um, that's a Ganoderma aplanatum, which is also called the artist plant. And it has dropped its spores, which are brown, even though its spores are white, it's got brown spores. And it has dropped its spores onto a, a cobweb underneath it. So which is kind of cool. Now, that, I'll talk real briefly about that mushroom there, the artist plant. It's a pretty cool mushroom. And they can get really, really big. I mean, like this big with the big flat things and you grow on dead wood and you can break off the dead wood and take the mushroom home with you. And that same day, you can take a stylus or like a fountain pen that doesn't have any ink in it or a dead ballpoint or any kind of thing that has a little point and you can draw on it and it bruises the pores. They turn brown and you can make scratch art on it. And some of it is quite elaborate. I've seen some really amazing mushroom scratch art. So it's kind of fun to do. If you see one, um, you can grab it, give it a scratch, and make marks on it. And then a couple days later, it dries completely hard, and it's set. It's not going not gonna to do anything different. It's always going to look like that. So that's kind of fun. Oh. The other thing that grows under caps in this region and elsewhere, but these are found here. Um, that's a tooth mushroom, and some mushrooms actually have the teeth as its forebearing structure. And I've picked these, the, that very mushroom on the left, I picked up here on the Centennial Trail. And they're edible and choice. They're also pretty easy to ID because not very many things look like that. I think it's really kind of a wild looking thing. Um, so the teeth in this case are the forebearing stru uh, structures and the Spores just drop between the teeth. On the right is another mushroom with teeth, but it's not a cap and stem. It's a, this is called a hiddenum, this is a hiddenum in this case, and a lion's mane. And these grow kind of, they start out like a knob growing out of a tree, and the teeth just grow down out of it. And there's a couple of different kinds of paresium. They're all edible. Lion's mane, which is what this one is, is also a prized medicinal, as well as being edible. It's been used for centuries in China and places like that for medicinal use, and I still see it sometimes listed on alternate pharmaceutical products that you can buy. If they list what's in it, this is one of the ones you'll often see because it's medicinal. It can be calming, um, can help with anxiety, a lot of things like that, so kind of interesting. All right. Here's some more mushrooms that grow up here. And these have kind of a different and somewhat revolting way of dispersing their spores. <laughs> these are shaggy manes, Caprinus tomatus, and they're really quite beautiful and statuesque when they're fresh like this, as you see them on the left of you. And you'll see them up here growing in driveways, sunny areas, grassy areas, that kind of stuff. And if you get them at this stage, good for you. Because if you get them about a day or two later, they start doing what you see on the top right. And what they're doing, the spores are ripening and they're turning black, and the cap is rolling itself inside out, and the spores will drop off of that curled edge that you see there. And then this is where it really gets creepy. The mushroom itself digests that. It's called delivoxing. It eats itself. Can't make this stuff up, I'm telling you. <laughs> doing that, it looks like that thing on the bottom right, that's the same mushroom. It looks like that. And they really do look like that, and it's disgusting. Mm -hmm. So these things are edible, pretty easy to identify. But if you are going to eat these things, you've got to pick them and cook them as fast as possible, because once you pick them, they'll start getting the pressing, and they'll turn black. So if you pick them, and you don't eat them that night, you put them in the fridge, the next day you got black food. So, if you do that, however, you can put those mushrooms that are turning black, put them into a jar, cover it up, and leave it at room temperature for a couple of days, and you get a black substance that can be used as ink. And I've seen whole books that were illustrated with um, inky cap ink. So it's kind of interesting. Here's another interesting way that spores are dispersed. And I'm almost done talking about spore dispersal, but this is really a big deal with mushrooms because this is what they're about. So that thing on the top left, she's my co-author on the mushrooms of the upper Midwest. This is Kathy Yerich. 
who is a vice president of the North American Mycological Society and also pretty big on the Minnesota Mycological Society. Uh, very, very knowledgeable lady, really good, and she's got a big puffball in her hand. And that one is pretty close to basketball size, and that's about as big as they get. But these grow up here too, and you'll see them. Not usually quite that big, they're quite that picturesque, that's a really pretty one. Puffballs can also be really small, like these little guys on the left, which I took up here. Those are pear-shaped puffballs that grow on a log. And what puffballs are is it's just it's a solid mass of material inside. There's no stem. It's just a big glob. And if you cut it open from top to bottom, it'll look like uncooked bread dough or uh, a marshmallow, maybe something like that. When it's in its edible condition, it's going to be pure white inside. If there's any kind, if you pick, especially with these little guys. If you pick one and you cut it in half and you see what looks like the outline of a mushroom, that's the poisonous amanita. Because amanitas, which is one of the most toxic species out there, they start life as a little ball like that. And they still they, the shape of the mushroom is shown inside the cross section of the cap. So if you get these little guys, you want to make darn sure that they don't have anything going on like that. And with any of the puff balls, they should be completely white inside and featureless. If they're starting to turn brown or yellowish or kind of ooky, they're cast time and you don't want to eat it. So we've got to cut them all in half. And if you don't pick them and cut them in half, they eventually get kind of rough, like shown on the top right. They get a little rough and they start to shrivel. The spores inside are ripening. The mushroom flesh is disappearing, turning into spores, so the, the skin is kind of shrinking up and getting rough. And they get a little hole in the top of them. And then the spores are released either by rain, by animals walking around on them, or by human activity. The kids just love to stop on these things when, they, when they've got spores in them, especially these big ones. I mean, they're like this big, and kids just love to stop on them. You get this big cloud of black dust or whatever. But anyway, that's somebody squeezing a little puff off to get get the spores out. You don't want to inhale these spores, by the way. Really not very good for you. It's not like, probably wouldn't make you sick, but you might get some respiratory distress, especially when kids are doing that stomp the big mushroom. That's really not a good idea to hear when that's going on. It's one that they don't die. So, all right. So, now we're going to get into something else. This is the really important stuff. So, you know mushrooms can be used to make ink, and that's pretty cool. Do you know that they might be able to help us tame global warming? Okay, here's the deal. So this is the mycorrhizal network. This is what I was talking about, that underground portion of the mushroom that's actually the mushroom. And this is made of very, very fine tubes called hecate, which are about one-fifth the width of a human hair. But these tubes are hollow. They carry nutrients, they carry fluids, they carry things, they turn into this mycorrhizal network that is literally underground anywhere that there's plants. You can't see it most of the time, but out here, out there, out there in your garden, it's there. And there is so much mycorrhizal material underground that if you step like this, and you could cut the cross section of the ground from under your foot, and you could count the mycorrhizae, it would be six miles in the length of mycorrhizae under your foot. That's how much there is. They're really tightly packed in there. So what do you say, what are, what's the purpose of this thing other than for the mushroom? Well, it's interesting because they help plants. The mushrooms can digest things, and they get enzymes and some things like that from the soil and from buried matter that are nutrients that plants need. And plants, above ground plants that have chlorophyll, are photosynthesizing and getting nutrients that the mushroom needs, that the mycelium needs. And they have this exchange. The mycelium gives the plant what it needs, and the plant gives the mycelium what it needs. And so it's a cooperative relationship that's really pretty amazing, and plants 90% or something of vascular plants use this network. It's really a high proportion. I mean, they, they kind of all have to. And in addition to passing nutrients and things like that back and forth, 
the mycorrhizal network is also used to communicate between plants. One plant, like a, a tree, might have, you know, its seeds have gone and made another tree a little bit of distance away, and the other tree is dying because it's not getting the nutrients it needs. And it can actually communicate, apparently, through the mycorrhizal network and tell the other plants and its parent plant that, hey, I need some help over here, and they can send nutrients to that plant that's sick. It's a pretty amazing concept. So this is a highly enlarged example of what it looks like. And these things, like I said, the mycorrhizae wrap themselves around the roots of the green plants, and they're so much finer that they're so much more efficient at getting nutrients and stuff out of the soil than the green plants are. And white pine, the pine, all pine, I guess, actually, can't thrive, can't even start, basically, without some mycorrhizae. So if people that are planting white pines, or pines, any kind of pines, they, if you're planting them in an area that's never held pines before, and it doesn't have the correct kind of mycorrhizae, it probably won't live. And so you can dig some dirt from underneath the pine and use that to plant your little pine. Or the, you can buy mycorrhizae that's specifically full of pine and inoculate the soil with that, because without it, they'll die. Which is, you know, we have a lot of problems with pine time out here, and this is, you know, not necessarily what's going on, but it sure doesn't help. I, every year when I plant my seedlings from headstrings and some guys it's like, hey, I should have done better than that. Okay, so, there are mushrooms that are considered mycorrhizal, which means these are the mushrooms that are specifically relating to plants in a symbiotic fashion. They have a specific relationship to a specific plant. And the mycorrhizal mushrooms, um, you've got, well, on the top left is an amanita. The, basically, your cat and stem mushrooms are like that. Uh, this is a this is a bolete. Bolete's a mycorrhizal. That's a chanterelle. Chanterelles are mycorrhizal. And when you see them, that's one thing people are ask, asking me lately. Where are you finding chanterelles? What are they relating to? And what that means is that that chanterelle has a relationship, a symbiotic relationship with a specific kind of plant or habitat. And people are saying, well, where are you finding them? What are you doing? And with morels, it's the same thing. They relate to a specific kind of tree in that case, dead elm, and that's where you look for them. And you can look other places, and maybe you'll find some, but you're going to have a lot better luck if you look at the right kind of habitat where these things have this mycorrhizal relationship with the specific plants, which is really interesting. So, in a mycorrhizal relationship, the plants are extracting phosphorus and other minerals, the pot and they're giving it to the plants because the plants can't get this themselves from the soil. The phosphorus causes the plants to grow larger. It's one of those things that makes plants grow big. And as the plants grow larger, they draw carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they transfer that to the mycorrhizal network where it is stored underground. This is what you read about trees storing carbon. This is what's going on. This is how it's happening. And scientists have figured out, I don't know how they do this, but during the Devonian period, which was three or four million, three or four hundred million years ago, there was a big surge of plant growth, and the plant boom was accompanied by a massive drop up to 90% in levels of carbon dioxide, triggering a period of global cooling during the Devonian period. So you think about our situation now, where we seem to have a little problem with global warming, and you think about what these mushrooms can do. There was an article in the International Journal called Plant Physiology. I have to read this off my script because I don't have this memorized. The International Journal Plant Physiology, which is a century-old publication of the American Association of Plant Biologists, that says that up to 5 billion tons of carbon flow annually from plants to mycorrhizal fungi. 5 billion tons. It's really a lot. So if you can make ink out of them, if you can save the world with them, they're amazing. Now up here we have a couple of plants. 
that they're not a chlorophyll producing plant. It's kind of odd to think of a non chlorophyll producing plant because producing the chlorophyll photosynthesis seems to be mean one of the things that the plant is plant. You know, I mean, we've got kingdom fun fungi, we've got kingdom plantae, we've got kingdom animalia, and fungi and mushrooms are in a completely different class from plants. But to me, plants, one of the things that define them is that they produce chlorophyll through photosynthesis. Well, these ones don't. And these are in kingdom plantae. That's monotropa, uniflora, which is also known as ghost pipe, Indian pipe, corpse plant, grows up here, has no chlorophyll. On the right, we've got spotted coral root, it's an orchid. Again, doesn't photosynthesize, doesn't produce chlorophyll. It gets all of the materials it needs from the mycorrhizal network, but it's not contributing anything to the mycorrhizal network because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't photosynthesize. So it can't give anything back. So it's kind of, they're freeloaders, it's what they are. But the other plants are willing to support them, which is kind of neat. And that whole uh, business about non chlorophyll plants was a real puzzle for a long time. And it was a Russian debate because how do they survive if they don't produce chlorophyll? How do these plants live? And there was a Rus Russian botanist in the late 1800s whose name I can't find, and I have really tried suggested that these odd plants might be getting the necessary nutrients through a fungal network. I don't know how he figured that out. He was ahead of his time. And in 1960, it took that long, a Swedish botanist named Eric Bjorkman proved this. He injected radioactive sugars into some trees, and then he measured nearby monotropa, and they had the same radioactive substances. So they had gotten it through the mycorrhizal network. And so he proved this relationship that this poor Russian group in the 1800s had it all figured out. Nobody believed them. They tried to knock them up. OK, so here's a, an interesting slide. If you did a search for the world's biggest mushroom, what do you think you'd find? Okay, well, knowing what you know now, I mean, if you do, you'll find out that the world's biggest mushroom is a honey mushroom, which grows up here. They're four to six inches tall. And it's like, what? That's not even big. It's, it's nothing. Well, remember that the mushroom is the underground portion. That's truly the mushroom, and that's what they're talking about. And in 1998, mycologists discovered, and foresters discovered a massive colony of Farmillaria stoi which is a variety of honey mushroom in the Oregon Blue Mountains. And mycologists being, they're very uh, persnickety people and wanting to prove facts and very, you know, let's dot the I's and cross the T's and all that stuff. They did DNA sampling and mating studies on these mushrooms and they determined that this colony, which is 2,300 acres in 1998, all of the mushrooms were genetically identical and that colony meaning that they are a single organism. So that colony, which they named the humongous fungus, <laughs> you gotta love mycologists, they're great. Uh, that far surpassed the previous record, which was a piddly little 37 acre colony in Michigan that had been discovered in 1992. You notice these dates are kind of recent, 1992, 1998. That's when the science of mycology proceeded to the point where they could do DNA analysis of mushrooms and they could do mating studies and all of this stuff. I mean, it was, it's a fairly recent thing. And as a book author, I can tell you, it causes me no end of grief because what's happening is that they're taking mushrooms that, you know, you say, well, that's, you should always learn the Latin name of a mushroom because it will never change. Well, unfortunately, that's not true because what they're doing is they're taking mushrooms that we have here and we've been calling it by this certain Latin name for years, based on the fact that it looks like that mushroom as it grows in Europe. You know, so you've got a mushroom that grows in Europe and it's called that in Europe, and then it got the, looks the same to me growing here, they call it that. Well, the mycologists do DNA and dating studies, and they say, no, 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 it's not the same thing. Looks like it isn't, and they rename it. They recategorize it, they put it into a different genus, and every mushroom book that's out there has incorrect information in it because you can't keep up with it. The floodgates have opened since about 2000, 2010. 
I've revised that mushroom book four times, trying to keep up with the names. It's really hard to do, but it's the way that it is. They're saying, well, this looks like that, but it isn't, so we're going to call it something different. So the Latin names don't necessarily help you that much sometimes. Anyway, back to the honey mushrooms. Um, honey mushrooms are a significant pathogen of oaks, hickories, maples, and some conifers. And that's why I mentioned foresters were some of the ones that discovered the humongous fungus category. And they have a really different method of spore dispersal. Their hyphae, which is the thing that makes mycelium, instead of just making these little tiny hair-like things, it turns into these big root-like structures called rhizomorphs, and those travel underground quite fast. And when they encounter a tree that they would like to eat, they get onto it, and they make this white, mold-like, rubbery mat underneath the bark, and then this, uh, the rhizomorph kind of, I've seen it on, I've seen it on standing dead trees, but I've seen it more on like logs or roots that are extending in the ground of a tree that's been killed with honey mushrooms, and you can see that stuff, and it gives it the other people call these mushrooms, they call it shoestring fungus, because these rhizomorphs look like shoestrings. But anyway, what happens is that this white mold gets into the tree, under the bark, encircles the entire base of the tree, denying it water and nutrients, and it kills the tree. And so these trees are a tremendous um, asset on the West Coast, and they're dying, they're being killed by honey mushrooms. And there's very little they can do about it. They've tried digging up the soil, all of the soil around trees, and replacing it with un unaffected, so it doesn't work. And so they're losing a lot of forest in the non west coast, but honey mushrooms we don't seem to have that problem here, although honey mushrooms do grow here. And I've seen the rhizomorphs on honey mushrooms in, you know, Athens State Park and stuff like that in Minnesota, but we don't seem to have the problem of the honeys being as devastating to forestry as they are on the west coast. It's a real issue out there. But anyway, that type of reproduction is a lot faster than wind-blowing spores and a lot more effective because you've got this big, thick, strong rhizomorph that's going to go through the soil and find another tree to kill, and that's what they do. So the Oregon colony is extending one to three feet each year to humongous fungus. That's it's kind of fast. And they, and they can estimate, based on the size that it is, and looking back on the timeline, and they estimate that it's 2,000 8,000 years old, that colony. So it's not only the world's largest mushroom, it is probably the world's oldest, certainly the world's oldest known mushroom. And another kind of cool fact about this, when a tree is infected with this arbolaria fungus like that, and it dies, the fungus is bioluminescent, meaning it glows in the dark. And if you're walking around in the woods, and you see one of these trees that has been infected and the bark has fallen off, it's glowing green. It's like, whoa. <laughs> I've seen bioluminescent mushrooms, it's, it's really something to see. It's like, wow, that's pretty cool. But that's one that, and that, that phenomenon, when you see it in the forest on these trees, it's called foxfire. If you've ever heard that word, that's what foxfire is. It's made from bioluminescent mushrooms. So, anyway, the honey mushrooms that are in this area, are edible. The caps are edible. The stems are too tough and you can make broth out of them. Always have to be well cooked and always properly identified, of course. But they do grow here. I see them all the time. Oh boy. There's another weirdo. This one's called the blob. <laughs> uh, in October 2019, the Paris Zoological Park put this slime mold called Pricerus polycephalium on display. Now this is a slime mold. It's technically not a fungi, but it's, it behaves like one a lot. It kind of eats the same things. It's people kind of consider them fungi. And in fact, we have them in that mushroom book because our advisor really likes slime molds and so we put them there. But um, they have a very unusual life cycle. Very strange way of reproducing. They have single cells called swarm cells. And during mating, these cells fuse to become one body called the plasmodium, which is a slimy mass of millions of cell nuclei surrounded by a single membrane. So it's one big cell. 
once it's in the plasmodium stage, which these are. And on this top right slide, that's from the that's from the parasitological exhibit. It says blue blob, and it says at nine hours, at eleven hours. That's how fast it grows. So that's that's from the Paris exhibit blue blob. I love it. Um, there's specific requirements before this fusing can happen. Each of the cells, before they do this fusing, has three genes. One of the genes has 16 loci, which is the location of the specific gene on the chromosome. One has 15 loci, and the other has three. You multiply 16 by 15 by 3, and you get 720 possible combinations, which to the human way of thinking equals 720 genders and sexual identities. There's another mushroom called uh, split gills, it's a final community that has more than 17,000 different gender identities. I'm not going to explain how they count that because it really gets complicated, but anyway, it's, there's a lot going on with mushrooms that you don't know about. Now here's an experiment that they did with the blob. Tyserum is it'll grow in the lab. It's very it's happy to grow anywhere it loves to grow, anywhere on your shoe, whatever it wants to do. And they feed it, they make patterns of these are raw gold oats. That Tyserum really digs raw gold oats. And in these experiments, this one shows a bunch of raw rolled oats laid out in a pattern, and then they put a single little blob of the plasmodium on there. And within five hours, that plasmodium is spread out and it's looking for food. And it's finding some. Eleven hours, it's found a lot more. Within 26 hours, it has located all of the, much for the uh, oatmeal, happy little Pisera. And what's interesting is it has canceled all of the paths that didn't lead to food. It only keeps the paths that lead directly to the food. The shortest path possible, it keeps that so that it's most efficient in eating that food. It can get there really easily because it's not going to go down a dead end road. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, there was a slide missing. Why? Right. I didn't mean to do that. Hmm. Well, there's another slide that shows that same thing. It was that last slide showing the connection, and that's the connection that the Pricera made between all these nodes and it's the exact, pretty darn, not exact, pretty darn close um, to the map of the Tokyo subway, which was what those blobs of oatmeal were. They were on the map of the Tokyo subway. These scientists like to put these little pieces of oatmeal on them. You know, they did one that was a map of the United States and a blob of oatmeal on each of the state capitals. And the price serum chased it, you know, did the highway system and all that stuff. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, they did another experiment with that same stuff where they took, you saw that slide where the, the, the blob was spreading its little tentacles out in kind of a circular thing. Well, they did an experiment where they took a block of wood and inoculated it with this stuff. And they put it on a surface, and the, the punji made a circular pattern like a spider web all around the block. I don't have any slides of this one. And it was growing in all directions looking for food. They couldn't find any because it was on a sterile laboratory. Well, then they put another block of wood that wasn't inoculated off to the left side. And they all went over there. And they cut off all of the paths that went nowhere. And they concentrated everything to go to that block on the left. And then the scientists took the block that had the Pricera in it, the one that was inoculated, took it out of its experimental scene scraped all the stuff off the side, put it back onto another glass slide without any wood over there, and it started growing to that left side again. It remembered that. It knew where the food was. So they seem to have some memory, which is pretty uh, pretty amazing. There's a, another delightful slime mold that grows up here called uh, dog vomit slime mold. <laughs> <laughs> Septica, and it grows like in your driveway sometimes, and it will remember when it encounters something it doesn't like, like if there's a blob of, it will, like they don't like salt. I don't know why there'd be salt on your driveway. Well, actually there would be salt on your driveway, there could be. It doesn't like that. And once it encounters that, it goes, look, I don't like that. And it grows the other way, and it will remember that for a long time. 
So, and also the blob, this is another great thing. The blob can sell up mazes, like a regular, you know, like a rat maze that has twists and turns or some paths don't go anywhere and some do. It'll grow into the maze. It explores every channel, and wherever there is a dead end, it pulls its tentacles back and only keeps the ones that lead to a food reward at the end, and it's the shortest path. So it remembers that too. And there was another experiment, this is the last one I'll tell you about, where they took, I think this might have been done with the uh, slime mold, where they took a blob of it and they put it on a surface and they was growing around looking for something to eat. And they put a cold pan on it. It didn't like that and kind of backed off and it went away from that. Then they turned the fan off. And 15 minutes later, they put the fan back on, and it didn't like that, and it backed off. And they did this three or four times, and then after that, 15 minutes later, they didn't turn the fan on, but it still went like that. It remembered. And it could tell time. Pretty amazing. All right. Okay, so this... Oh, the type is a little funny there. Oh, that's all right. Mushrooms are more than a pretty face, they're a tasty bite. They're used medicinally, and that is a very old story. For thousands of years, mushrooms have been used medicinally. In September of 1991, two hikers in the Utsal Alps on the Austria-Italy border discovered a frozen, desiccated human corpse. And authorities thought it was probably a recently deceased mountaineer. So, you know, they brought everybody in and looked at it. And the recovery was really difficult because it was frozen into the ice and it was kind of hard to get at it. They didn't want to wreck it. But they had removed some ice and some found items and a couple days later they called in a couple of well-known mountaineers, these two dudes here. And they looked at it and they said, no, it was leather clothing, birch bark containers that they had excavated. They said, it's, this is really old. This isn't a mountaineer from 20 years ago or something. This is, this is old. And they got the body out. This is what was called a wet mummy. It's the only known wet mummy because it was mummified by temperature intact. You know, Egyptian mummies were, they would take the organs out, put them in jars, and all of that stuff. Well, this one didn't get any of that kind of treatment. And so he had his internal organs still in. And they were able to do a lot of analysis of it. And they just they figured out that he was 45 years old. He'd been shot with an arrow. They found it in his shoulder. This was during the Copper Age. So, well, they, they figured out through carbon dating that he lived between 3350 and 3100 BC. That's the Copper Age, making the mummy older than Egyptian pyramids and older than Stonehenge. And he had a copper accident. And like I said, the arrowhead that he was shot with probably had some copper in it. They found it embedded in his shoulder. He clearly got into some trouble with somebody and got shot and yeah. ended up like that. Um, they also discovered that Utsi, which is what they named him, had the eggs of an intestinal parasite called whitworm in his digestive tract, and he also had Lyme disease. And the British medical journal Lancet postulated that Utsi may have been using a fungus called birch polypore on the right hand side down there as a laxative to purge himself of the woodworm. And birch polypore is also used to check bleeding, making it useful for a primitive hunter. Those two things on the right were part of what they recovered next to the body. There are two birch polypore that he had been carrying with him for medicine, for you know, checking bleeding, whatever. So Uzi and his artifacts are preserved at the South Tyrol Archaeological Museum of Museum in Balzano, Italy. Poor old Uzi. Another item that Uzi had was Omus voluntarius, which is the tinder fungus, and this also grows up here. And he had a pouch that contained large chunks of it and shavings. And this fungus contains iron pyrite, which is a fire starter. And they knew about that back then. And he had a big block of it, he had little shavings, and he could take a little pile of his shavings, put it onto some dry wood or grass, whatever he had, and he could strike his bigger block against the stone, it would make sparks and ignite a fire. 
So he used it as a fire starter. And they also had specific properties, meaning which they stopped believing. And Hippocrates wrote about this in 400 BC. And these mushrooms were used by ancient Greek barbers. If they made a little mistake when they were shaving somebody, they could clean up the blood. The part of the fungus that's used is called amadou. It's one of the layers inside the fungus. You have to peel the outside of the fungus off, and then you have to boil it in sodium carbonate, which is washing soda, and then you have to pound it some more and boil it some more, and then you dry it, and you can use it as a fabric. And this, one of the oldest uses known in modern times, is as a dryer to dry fishing flies. And Orvis still sells an Amadou patch. That's what this is. 30 bucks in its worth. And that's made from mushrooms. And that's used. This, you put your wet fly in there and you just close the cover and it dries your fly off. And it's also used to make a sort of a felt like fabric. These two shots on the right, this is done in Romania. I don't know why Romania is the only place that does this, but they are. And they're still doing it to this day. They make hats out of mushrooms. These are mushroom hats made out of the Amadou fabric. And you can buy that one at the top for 300 to $500 shipped from Transylvania. And you can learn to make Amadou your... What are you? Yeah, but it's FedEx, it said. I looked it up. Like, you can get anything. These I don't think they got it at Amazon, though. I don't know why. Um, if you're interested, you can look up online how to make Amadou, and you will actually find instructions to do this yourself if you want to start making it. Other mushrooms that have a lot of medicinal uses. This one, these are all from above, the top two are from here. This is chaga, which is a very well-known thing up here. In a notice, because it grows up birch, and it looks like a charcoaly black blob, and if you break it off, it's brown inside and it's crumbled and used as a medicinal tea. And it's been used in Slavic countries for generations, I don't know how long, a very long time, as a tea to prevent and to cure cancer. And this is another thing. I see Chaga in modern day medicinal kind of alternative things that you can buy. It often has Chaga in it. And people come up to this area to look for Chaga and they cut down trees and because it's usually too high up to get at, and they've got to cut down the tree to get it. Well, the tree's going to die anyway. If it's got child, it's already dead. But. Um, another mushroom that grows up here, that photo was taken over the mountain, the top right, that's Tremides versicolor, which is called turkey tail. Another thing that shows up in alternative medic medicinal preparations today, grows on dead trees, and it's credited with curing cancer in some pretty well-documented cases, um, which is pretty amazing. And the Ganoderma species, that thing on the bottom right, this is uh, the lacquered polypore, Ganoderma lucidum. It's been used in China for over 2,000 years you know, for longevity, to reduce fatigue and stress, boost the immune system, potentially fight cancer cells. You can purchase it today as reishi or bing chi. And again, this is appearing in a lot of Western pharmaceuticals these days. Very, very old. That stuff grows in hot humid climates in Asia and elsewhere, so that photo is from Portugal. Okay, so we've got some mushrooms that aren't happy leaving other fungi alone and they want to change them. So this is the lobster mushroom, which is another thing that's pretty well known up here. It's an edible, considered a pretty good edible. And what it is, is it's a parasite, a fungus, called Hypomyces lactiflorum, and it parasitizes Russula or Lactarius and turns it into a completely different thing. This mushroom here turns into what you see on the right. This mushroom on the left is, what was that? I can't remember what that one was. Doesn't matter, it's lactarius. And when the, the, uh, when the fungus hits the lactarius or the rustla, it does it while they're still in pre-emergent states or underground. And so when the mushroom comes out of the ground, it's already got this orange, it's already happened, the metamorphosis has happened, and they, they get orange, they get this kind of pimply surface, they, the, the shape changes, sometimes you can still see sort of gill like suggestions, other times they just look like blobs. I've picked quite a few of these on the Chippewa crowns. And like I say, they're found in this area, they taste 
Most people say they taste like seafood. They do sometimes. Some taste kind of peppery or curry like and I think that I've had them that way myself. And I think that depends on exactly which species they parasitize. So I think that the curry flavor stuff comes from something else. Okay, talking about parasites, here's something really revolting. This is one of the weirdest parasites in the fungal world. This one doesn't infect mushrooms, it infects insects and causes them to sprout mushrooms from their bodies. It's called the zombie fungi, Ophiocordyceps. 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 And it's called zombie fungi because it takes over the whole central nervous system to modify behavior in a way that benefits the fungus. When an ant gets into some of these spores on the ground, and they thank God these don't live here, these are down in the Amazon and stuff like that. But when an ant gets a spore, the spore penetrates the ant's carapace, the outside, and it gets into the ant's nervous system. And it affects its nervous system and its muscles. And it makes the ant climb nearby vegetation to a location that's favorable to the fungus as far as uh, humidity and light and all that stuff. And then the ant clamps its jaws, the, is directed to clamp its jaws onto the, uh, the central rib of a plant or a stick or something like that. And some accounts say that mycelium also grows from the ant's feet to attach it to the tree so that it's stuck on that tree. And then the fungus eats the ant's insides. And then it sprouts mushrooms from the ant's body, which is what you see here. And then those mushrooms open up and drop their spores onto the forest floor and a single one of these will make a killing field that's about 10 square feet. And then another ant walks on it, and the cycle is repeated. Zombie fungi. I can't make this stuff up. Anymore. OK, so after that grand topic, and we're getting near the end here, I'm going to talk about a couple of exciting things that are happening today. Micro, micro remediation is a form of environmental repair using fungi-based solutions to decontaminate the environment. My ceiling pretty much digests whatever it encounters, oil, slicks, cigarette butts, whatever. Turns it into something else. And a company called VTT Technical Research Center in Finland, not Finland, Minnesota, but Finland mm -hmm. over the ocean, mm -hmm. developed a filter made of mycelium mass that can recover gold and copper from electronic scrap, which is a non-toxic method that is a whole lot better than shipping, shipping them to the third world countries to be burned, which is what's the traditional thing to do with e-waste. In Mexico, a company called EcoFilter uses mycelium from oyster mushrooms, which is, that's an oyster mushroom right there on the left, where all gets plastering on this. They use mycelium from that to break down cigarette butts that people collect from ashtrays and just whatever. Each, they, they say that each cigarette butt contains up to 7,000 chemicals and can pollute 13 gallons of water. And the process renders the cigarette butts into cellulose pulp that can be used to make paper products. Crazy. In closer to home, poster my oyster mycelia can also be used to help clean up toxic ash from the massive 2017 fires in Northern California, which destroyed 250 square miles of open space and urban development. That's the top right photo. And, and these are houses and buildings and businesses that burned down. I'm sure you all remember that. It was a disaster. And the ash contains PCBs, dioxins, and other heavy metals, all kinds of stuff, because it was industrial waste. It was things in your garage. You think about what's in your garage, and it's all burned, and it's all starting to the rainy season was starting and all this ash was going to flow into the streams and the creeks. And they took big bats of straw and used it to try and prevent the stuff from, from, the, from flooding into the waterways. And some of them they inoculated with oyster mushrooms and they ate and converted the toxins. Pretty amazing. And um, micro, micro remediation has also been used to clean up oil pools in the Amazon, boat fuel pollution in Denmark, contaminated soil in New Zealand, PCBs in Washington State, Spokane River, and pesticides in Oregon Creek. And there was a big oil spill in 2007 in San Francisco Bay, that you might remember, 58,000 gallons of oil leaked into that. And they took mats of human hair that they collected from a variety of sources, and they inoculated them with oyster mushrooms, 
and the spores converted the hair mats into non-toxic compost. Okay, this is almost the end of it. Here's another interesting micro trend, microfabrication using mycelium. This shot here, the big shot, is mushroom leather made with mycelium cultured in special racks shown at the little photo in the middle there. After a week or 10 days, the mycelium, which has been fed with sawdust and organic material, which they'll eat anything, grows into a foamy layer that's like smashed marshmallows. And then the foamy layer is harvested and then it's tanned and dyed using an eco-friendly process and eco-friendly chemicals. The leftover organic material is composted and the finished mush mushroom leather is beaten and it's used for products such as footwear, jackets, wallets, and handbags. Uh, the handbag shown on the right was made for Stella McCartney, Paul McCartney's daughter, uh, with Linda McCartney. Her mother was a big environmentalist and vegetarianism, and all that stuff was a really a big part of her life, and her daughter is very much that way. Unfortunately, mushroom leather is still in its infancy, and it's very expensive, not to mention Stella McCartney's name. Is probably adding a little to the price tag. That handbag goes for a cool three thousand dollars, wow. and it's available online right now at Amon Marcus if you want to find one. Okay, last thing: spore prints. This is a mushroom-related activity that's fun for everyone, especially kids. So what you do, and I made some spore prints yesterday to bring. You, take a, you pick a mushroom, and if you do cap and stem mushroom is typical, but you could do it with uh, bracket fungus too. Take a, pick a cap that's fresh, not all clucky looking, uh, or not all dried out or icky or anything, but it has to have started to open. It has to be at least partially open. Cut off the stem as close as you can to the cap, and then you lay it on a piece of paper, and if, if you don't know what kind of spore it's going to produce, if it's going to be dark spores or light spores, you have this paper that's half black and half white. And I took some mushrooms that I picked yesterday and I put them on some of these things and I got some spore prints. And this one, I'll pass this around because where you can come up and look at it. This one up here is just crazy. It's got kind of a developed spore print. This had all these weird little trails on it. I didn't know what it was. And I had this thing sitting on my desk this morning and out of the side of my eye, I saw a little worm crawling around. <laughs> and it had crawled all over the spore print and made little trails in the spores. So kind of cool. But I did make some sheets of black and white paper. If anybody wants to take some and do your own spore print, what you do is just, as I said, you cut off the cap of a mushroom as close to the cap as you can, lay it half on the black, half on the white, and then put a bowl or something over it so nobody's tempted to pick it up and what the heck is that thing, and leave it overnight, and then it'll produce some spores for you. So if anybody wants some of this paper, you can have that. And that background photo is a spore print I made of one of those green spore labiota with a golf ball on a stick. And it's called green spore labiota because its spores are green. How about that? And those mushrooms get pretty big. That spore print is it's actually about that big. And I did some spore prints. I took the prettiest ones, let them dry, I sprayed them with artist spray paint. And I had them framed, and I gave one to my co-author and one to our technical advisor when the mushroom book was first done. I said, thank you, Gil. But anyway, that's a score, right? So anyway, that's what I have. And thank you for coming, and thank you for supporting Chickwalk. And if anybody's got any questions, let me know. And if anybody wants to, we can take a quick little hook around the, the grounds and look and see if there's any mushrooms around. But that's fine if nobody wants to, too. So. I have heard of it up here. I have never seen it, but I know that it can grow here. I've seen it in western Wisconsin, just a little bit south of here. So it does, it, it is a potential. Can deer eat amanitas and live? A lot of them can. I mean, yeah, they can eat a lot. Some amanitas are so deadly that they probably kill even the deer, but they, just because an animal can eat a mushroom doesn't mean we can eat a mushroom. Right. Never rely on that. That's not, that's not right. But I have seen deer eating amanitas that I wouldn't eat. I've never heard of one eating, like, the most deadliest of amanitas is the, uh, 
what's called the destroying angel, and one mushroom cat will kill two adults. I mean, it's that deadly. Like, I've never heard of a, of a theory of those, but I have seen them or heard of them. I've seen where they've been eating on like that that pretty orange thing that, that I have the picture of. It was an, that's an anomaly that's scary. Do the anomalies produce a neurotoxin, or how do they how do they kill you? Yes. Well, actually, the anomaly death is quite interesting, but it's it's actually that. That isn't a neurotoxin, I don't think it's classed as that. What it does is it destroys the liver. Um, if you eat an amanita, you get pretty sick, like within a couple hours of the next day, you're going to feel pretty bad, and maybe go to the hospital, and maybe say, gee, I was eating some mushrooms, boy, I'm dumb. Or you might just blow it off, and then a couple days later, you feel okay. And then a couple days after that, on about day four or five, you basically die because your liver has been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And the only solution for it is a liver replacement. They've been experimenting with some things to try and remediate that kind of death. And I don't know that they've been successful yet. But neurotoxins, you think of uh, that, that orange mushroom that had the, the yellow spots on it. Those grow up here, they're all over the place. We call that one toxic. It's actually a hallucinogen. And so we call it toxic because we don't want someone to eat it and not know what they're doing. Um, I don't want you to eat them even if you do know what you're doing. But anyway, um, a lot of times that, that's definitely a, neuro, a neurological toxin that's going on with that stuff. So mushrooms have different kinds of toxins, neurologic and whatever you call it, that affect hepatic, I suppose it affects the liver, but um, lots of ways to make you sick. I just want to be clear on something. You were talking about honey mushrooms? Yes. Do the honey mushrooms kill a live tree or do they? Yes. They kill a live tree. They kill live trees. honey mushrooms on your yard? You know, that's a good question, Guy, because I see honey mushrooms up here all the time. Yeah. And I have never seen tree death caused by honey mushrooms here. I got stumped. It was like old and rotten, and all of a sudden, one year, a year ago, it was just covered with honey, honey mushrooms. mushrooms. Yeah, they, they'll. Yeah, which comes first? The, yeah, the honey mushrooms. I mean, the big concern out on the west coast is that honey mushrooms do kill okay. all fresh, live trees, healthy right. trees. It kills them, but they'll also. It takes them 15 years or so to kill a tree, and so if a tree was dying and got cut down and left a stump, there's still plenty of food for that honey on there, so they're still eating it. Okay. So how when you're. Are they killing the cypress trees or the redwoods? Or? Not cypress. Uh, well, I, not that I know of. It's oak and hickory. And, oh, okay. Yeah, maples and some pine. But uh, they're, they're, it's pretty effective, and the Forest Service is really up in arms about it up there because they're losing a lot of forests in it. Specifically, that was the, those photos were from the Malheur uh, Forest in, in the Blue Mountains. What, what, uh, um, do morels like to... Okay. Morels are chateaus, which means they live, they, they're not uh, mycorrhizal mushrooms that live in concert with a, with a plant. They are things that are digesters. They're going to get rid of organic waste. So they're eating dead things or things that are dying. And they're typically found, in my experience, around elms, but they're also found around apples, old apple orchards. Um, tulip trees out east, if you're from the east coast, you have tulip trees. Some poplar occasionally, I've heard, but you, I always look for them under towns. And that's, that's kind of your number one thing. Up here, there are no elms and there are morels. Not a lot of them. And I have yet to figure out what they're growing on up here. I've seen them, but I don't know what they're growing on. Yeah. So Somebody has to tell me what they're growing on because I don't know. The literature doesn't say what they grow on up there. Probably some kind of pine, but you know, it's something that's dead or dying, and they're just going to eat off of that. That's what they do. That's what they like. I wish I could tell you what to look for up here because they do grow up here. Usually in grassy areas, I think, is where you're going to see them up here. So there must be some sort of root thing that's in the grass that they like, which I don't know. I've heard of black morels being the dominant species. Yeah. They may just grow in the certain forests, so maybe where estrums have logged down the trail. That's like a, maybe a year or two afterwards. That's a possibility that they're like fire I mean they are fire mushrooms, they'll grow when yeah, there's been fire. Yeah. Fire or whatever. 
Yeah, that's that's a good point. I should, I should have said that they do go where there's been fires, just like blueberries do too. Yeah. You know, a lot of things. Do. So, but that, I'm glad you pointed that out. That's true. So. All right. Cool. I'm sorry. Yes, um, that's all right. I I noticed there aren't many green mushrooms. There might be some like green tinted. There are green ones. Some yeah. small ones, but majority of mushrooms seem to be. Anything but, I mean, you can find, you know, purple mushrooms and like yeah. the indigo mushrooms, so they're coming yeah. all colors, but not a lot of green, and I'm wondering if people know why if it's... I've never heard why. There's green rustlers that I've seen yeah. up here. Um, there's some little green, what are they? There's a couple of little tiny little green guys. I don't know. That's a good question. I've never heard why that is. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry I can't answer that because it's a good question. We'll have to do some research. Yeah. Uh, you had a name for the uh, the fungus that uh, make the amber from. I've always called it the horse hoof. Uh, a horse hoof, yeah. Because that's what it looks like. It looks like a horse hoof. That's yeah. exactly right. I call it the tinder fungus. The tinder. Well, I've heard it called the false tinder fungus, where the the uh, um, I'm sorry, the other famous. Uh, well, it's Fulmis fomentarius, which is the amadou, the, the okay. horse hoof. Yeah, uh, okay. False uh, tinder would be uh, probably that, like another, again, a derma or something okay. like that would be my okay. guess. I've got that backwards, have I? Well, either that or I do. Um, like I say, they change the names on these things too, uh, but even common names aren't. I, I do use it for flint steel fires all the time. Do you? Good for uh, you. Yeah, I was a scout master for many years, and I taught all my scouts, you know, this is what you got to with the char cloth anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much better. Oh, that's cool. That's great. That's that's really neat to hear. There's another mushroom up here that's a shelf mushroom like that called, uh, oh, what's its name? I can't think of its name. Glinus ignearius. Maybe that's it, because that has fire in the name. Maybe that's used, too. But that one is something that... Um, Native cultures in Alaska, the Inuit, unfortunately, they take that stuff and they burn it and they mix it with tobacco ash and it makes a smoking mixture that is 10 times stronger than nicotine alone and you get kind of a big buzz off of it. It also ruins your teeth, ruins your health in general, and it's addictive, it's all hell. And it's a real problem with the Inuit up there. The public health are just working on that to try and discourage that practice and I see that mushroom up here on a fairly regular basis. I'm thinking if I wanted to make a quick buck I could sell these to Alaska but obviously yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but there's a lot of weird mushrooms. Um I found a mushroom that's probably it had actual holes in the stem that was probably something caused by slugs. Most likely. I mean, there's ornamentation on stems. Thank you. Ornamentation on stems that are patches or little tiny holes, but not holes all the way. Were they holes all the way through or just partial? Yeah, like, yeah. Hole, uh, was it like the stem itself and rib? And then it had a hole. Through it? Through it. Yeah, that was probably slug cause. There is a phenomenon that happens on, specifically on some hole leaks where it uh, it gets like little pimples on the surface, so they're like pock marks, like little little holes, but they don't go all the way through, they're just surface ornamentation. But if it's holes all the way through, that's probably slugs. Okay, well, thank you.